position is 4125 North, 4407 West. Friday, August 8th, ran into this small, small boat making a crossing of the Atlantic for the first time to set a record for a crossing with only an outboard motor. If boats could talk, this little ship would have one hell of a story to tell. In 1985, she set the Guinness Book of World Records for being the first outboard power boat to cross the Atlantic. But that's just the start of the story. Today, we're heading to the home of Al Grover to hear more about this little ship's epic tale. Dressed in a short sleeve, Tommy Bahama style fishing shirt and blue jeans, Grover, 94, seems impervious to the August afternoon's heat and humidity as he invites me into his home. Stepping through the front door is like walking into a maritime museum. Interesting salty artifacts fill his living room where he settles into a floral armchair. Aviator style glasses and a white beard that begins at his sideburns, Ahab style only hint at his age, which is impossible to predict thanks to his tack-sharp wit. Since 1950, Al Grover's High and Dry Marina has been a fixture of Freeport, New York seascape, offering everything from new boats and motors to service, support, and storage. For decades, the Salty Fishing Village and Al Grover were synonymous. Now, fast forward 50 years, and my parents began keeping the family boat at Grover's in the winter months. As a kid, this boatyard was something of a playground for my brother and I. We would run around for hours pretending that trailers were battleships and old zinks were grenades. Just a couple of boys dreaming of adventure. Years later, I would come to learn that there must have been something in the water. Al Grover was not just an unknown name on a marina, but someone who captured the attention of the nautical world. Now, I finally had the chance to sit down with Grover to hear his incredible, made for Hollywood story firsthand. We spent about a year really going over it. I got one of the first satellite navigators at Raytheon. There was only a few satellites a day to try and get a fix, and it wasn't very good, you know. So basically, we had the Lorraine and uh, talking to ships, which was great, because uh, almost every ship will talk to you on a VHF. Yeah. And usually the guy on duty on the ship is very happy to have someone to talk to, especially if they've been, you on know. On board, especially yeah. a boat that looks like yours yeah. way out there. Yeah, right, and it, we made some good friends and got help. You always got a perfect correction on your navigation, your position, and the weather and everything once you get talking. The uh, start was delayed to try and do it right. And uh, carrying fuel, I had ordered like these inflatable tanks, uh, very heavy plastic, and without baffles and testing them, this is getting five, six hundred gallons of fuel mm -hmm. sloshing around, you know, that I said, that's not going to work. I, I can't control that half full fuel tank. And then I had built my boats with 40 gallon saddle tanks. They're one on each side. I had an inventory of those. And I said, let me see how many of those I can squeeze into my boat. So I ended up with 18 40-gallon tanks, 18. We disconnected the, the rudder from the normal hookup because this was an inboard diesel. Oh, yeah. So yeah. the point is, if you take a pair of big engines, I figured they were big to me, 65s, and you hook them up, there's a lot of friction required to turn them. They yeah. weren't using hydraulics or anything, you were using push-pull cables. And that would use up a lot of energy because the autopilot, which you have to have, is question. constantly fighting this thing. So we locked the engines dead ahead. We hooked the autopilot to the rudder. 
which was still in the boat. Ah. And the rudder is so easy to move because there's no 200 pounds of iron. So, so just to be clear, your autopilot ran the rudder. Didn't right. Touch the, didn't touch the outboard. Two That's engines were dead ahead. We wow. Only, uh, ran, that makes more sense. Yeah, well, uh, we do. For instance, you're going to run one engine at a time yeah. because you right. can't double your mileage by running a second engine. So yeah. you tilt one up mm -hmm. and you run the other one until either you could hear the plugs were getting fouled, you could hear it because you came so loose. This is 24 hours a day. Yeah. You don't stop at night. Right, right. So we found the plugs were getting little tiny red rusty spots on them and then we'd decide to change plugs. Mm -hmm. So we'd run one engine, tilt the other engine up. If the weather was good, you'd work your way to the stern, take the engine hood off, turn it, change the plugs. So things like that you uh, didn't anticipate, but we had plenty of spare plugs and parts. Sure, you know? sure. So we ended up mix our own oil, uh, get rid of the ability to change those engines because we had four 12 volt batteries, four, pretty healthy, but I didn't understand. Again, the damn 65s only had like 10 amp alternators. So now we're running all of this electronics and we're, uh, we're not running the big engine, but we are running the, uh, so our batteries weren't Draining. keeping yeah. up. And once they get below like 11 volts or something, the electronics are all screwed up. You don't get true readings again. Mm -hmm. So we figured disconnect the three batteries because we had switches on them yeah. and keep one healthy battery, you know, charge it up. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of other things we did. We carried a small steady and sail forward, which you might have seen in the picture. It was not much bigger than actually it was a sunfish mast. You know, the sunfish with no cables That's or stays and a small steady sail. And when it blew real hard, I could reach that from the hatch. The only way we got in and out of the cabin is the top hatch. Everything aft was solid closed. And after the cabin was closed, the rear deck was covered with canvas. Yeah, and right, right. Under the canvas were the air tanks, which I had called fuel tanks. And my wife said, why don't you inflate them since you already paid for them and lash them on the stern deck for great buoyancy. That's your wife's idea? Yeah. Genius. Yeah, and so they had big grommets on there to lash them down. And the deck was covered with canvas. But now this bubble of air, these were several hundred gallon tanks, up in the top, if the boat did a 180, if she did capsize, the buoyancy of those yeah. air tanks trying to fl float would, we failed to be a good help. But the other thing we didn't consider was the fact that the following seas breaking over the stern are absorbed by this cushion of air. You know, these tanks were somewhat mushy, you know? Yeah. So, uh, few hundred gallons of water would break over the stern and it would be just shed, you know, by a little resiliency and then. I mean, that's, that's great background. I mean, maybe, maybe we'll just, we'll just fast forward to, uh, you know, the, the start of the adventure. We decided to leave from the island of St. Pierre and that's off the coast of Newfoundland. And that's where they sent the fuel truck down to the dock this fuel truck and I uh, topped off all my tanks with the oil mix and all at that point and we met a we're at the dock and there's a sailboat just ahead of us everyone speaks French there I mean a little English but they're basically French and this guy comes over where are you going I said I'm going to Europe and he looks down at this little boat and he says look crazy but he said we are going too he had a 60-foot sailboat catch he was delivering for somebody and he said we'll keep in touch on the radio because we won't be together because he's trying to sail and i'm powered so we left there way after a big party and boy i want to tell you i was really <laughs> you know i mean are we really going now and <laughs> 
I said, it's now or never, you know, you can't change your mind now. You never go home. <laughs> I'd have to go hide someplace. So we left from uh, St. Pierre on August 1st, 1985, knowing it's the hurricane season and saying, it's time, now or never. And the first night out was pretty good. During the day, it was beautiful. And I was listening, by the way, the Loran signals up in the Canadian area were better than our signals here. They lasted further out in the ocean, like a oh, thousand miles. Wow. Yeah, and uh, that night I heard a couple of boats talking. They, Did you hear about the storm coming? We got a real northeast, you know, the big low coming through. And I said, oh boy, first night. And it started to blow and blow and blow, and we were really miserable. I mean, we hadn't really got used to this. And uh, the following morning, we were <laughs> both said, hey, what do you think? I said, we are not up to it. We didn't sleep all night. We're wet, we're cold, but it's blowing northeast. And I said, if I try to go back, these outboards are gonna be cavitating out of the water. I had this thing about the island off there, which is Sable Island. Yeah. You know about yeah, it? You know? Yeah. And now I'm not sure where we are, and I may have to quarter it or, or run in a beam sea because I can't head into it. And that damn island had been the graveyard from so many ships. And I said, in the middle of the night, I'm running blind, you know? And period if we had been able to quit we would have quit that's now that you can leave out but you don't have to but i mean that's how the realism hit you yeah everything else is great stories we're gonna do this we're gonna then you're wet, wet and cold and tired and the boat had been taking water all night and these electric pumps you could hear them go on you know they float operated and the pump would go on, and then it would run for a while to go up. I said, Alan, damn, a lot of water coming in. You can't figure it. Well, we had put the pump discharges in the top plank, which we felt is normal. And these planks were submerging. And there was no check valve on the discharge of a water pump. Mm -hmm. Not Maybe there would be for the, Someone knew better. We we never bought a water pump shuts the water overboard. That's the end of it. She had three wa water pumps, probably three quarter inch discharge or more. And every time we were submerged, water was coming back. So Al got under the deck and under the rear tanks and he found the pumps and he plugged somehow or other. We kept kept the water from coming aboard. I don't recall kinking it or putting a flapper valve on it or something. But that was really a miserable night. And then to hear these pumps going on, and say, I can't believe it, this boat has never leaked a drop. But she's taking water. And that was, that was all enough to sober us up and say, let's forget this damn thing. Wow. But it, there was no going back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you might. You physically couldn't. You, you, couldn't you, you would have run out of, not, you couldn't run out of all the fuel, but you would have wasted a lot of fuel. Mm -hmm. And and I got the French captain on the phone, Captain Claude. He had two people. He had a woman with a name Maya, a French lady, and Pierre, his uh, first mate, and didn't speak much English, but he'd get on, oh, Captain Grover, Grover, no problem, no problem, he's no problem, and you must, you must, and I told him I'm gonna quit, no, you must, we, we wait, we, we, we will be here. And then I'd sing, darling, je vous aime beaucoup, <laughs> oh, love the on rose, you know. What does that mean? I don't know. It's French songs. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Sounds nice. <laughs> and uh, they were sort of encouraging, and we were in sight because he's already disappeared someplace. And but it probably made you feel not not feel so alone, right? It makes it makes a difference. Just uh, no. Well, he says we wait. We will wait. We. 
but we we never stayed together and then I fell overboard, you know. Yes, yeah, so that yeah. was stupid. That can, was, can we can we jump to that? Jump we to can, that but you know, again, not thinking. You know, this was like the tenth day out, and now we tried to make four hours on and four hours off, and we couldn't stay awake for four hours. It was torture to stay. So we said, let's say two hours on and two hours off, and we could stay awake that long. And that probably doesn't sound right, but for some reason, you, it was tough to stay away. Sure. And uh, I decided to put down the, the little engine, a 9.9, which didn't have a power tilt. Now, the big engines come standard with electric power tilts. You could tilt them up, yeah. start them from the cabin, put them down. The little engine, you had to go back. And we had three or four rules now. You never leave the cabin unless you wake up the other guy. The other guy's on the floor between fuel tanks down at the bottom of the little boat. And I looked down there and he's sleeping so soundly. Oh, the poor guy, leave him alone. You never leave without a life jacket. You never leave without your safety hook or the cable that we're in from bow to stern. You snap on, so if you go overboard, you know. And other things that you've learned, and sometimes it might be a headache, but it's not bad to drag 50 to 100 foot of half-inch nylon behind the boat. If you don't go overboard, and you're lucky enough to swim to that hook of line, you can hang on to it. You're not gonna back up and get it in the props, but under normal conditions, that line would keep clear and it would be a safety. I didn't obey any of those. So I went out, you had to do a toe dance along the gunnel because the back was covered. And then I got to this engine. Now, if you remember the little engines, they had a click when you tilted it. You clicked it up by hand, it got click, and it would stay at that position. To get it down, you first had to pull up and that would release it, and or you could do it by hand. I forgot all about that, and I started pushing that engine. This is a little engine, right? 10, 9.9. Push down is now, damn thing isn't going. I'm getting madder and madder. Finally, somehow I must have jiggled it, and when I pushed the last time, I had my whole body going in that direction. The engine flopped down, and I did a flip over the engine. <laughs> Boy, did I yell. Al says he heard me. I doubt it. I think. Something woke him up, then he stuck his head out of the cabin. He sees me swimming behind the boat. It was a good day, nice weather, no, no storm, and daylight. Those are good factors, right? So he couldn't make a tight turn now because the engines are stuck, and the, the rudder is a secondary effect. I mean, there's no prop blast, you know, to give it stiff resistance. So he's making a big circle. And I figured he'd think, oh, there's a good chance to get rid of the old man, you know. <laughs> he circled back. I climbed on board, and we talked about that. And we he said, did circle back. It made one big, long circle. Yeah, long, long, long circle. Because he said, well, I back down. I don't want to back and reverse the, the guy swimming in yeah, the turbulence. Right, yeah. so, so it was so foolish. I mean, anyone would say, you got to be stupid to do that. So, I mean, you get back on board, you're catching your breath. I mean, you guys just looking at each other, like, what was that like? Well, it, I was say, damn glad he turned around. <laughs> I don't know why, but I just defied all the safety rules that we had made up. That said, we gotta do it this way. So, I'm not proud of that. I'm pretty proud that I got back, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, it's foolish to, uh, to admit that you did a lot of bad mistakes. It's not foolish to admit it. It's foolish that it happens, and if you don't admit it, but well, this this wasn't the end of kind of the the, the life and death struggle. You guys, it, you guys hit a hurricane well, a couple the, of days after that? Yeah, the 17th of August. Hurricane Claudette. Now, hurricanes, we came used to the fact that they begin the Caribbean and come towards Florida and up the coast, probably not realizing there are a lot of them that go up to Europe. And this one had come through 
and uh, Bermuda, mm -hmm. and then headed for the Azores, mm -hmm. which is 800 miles off of Portugal. Yeah. And it, it was unusual that uh, we didn't think, we think, okay, there's a hurricane that was gonna go to Florida. It's gonna, it's gonna be America. We, we, own, we own the hurricanes, but we don't see. <laughs> we found out we didn't. So then Claude got on the radio. He had a single side band and so did we. That was very good, 24 hours. I could call my wife on the phone, you know. It was amazing. Oh my God, I get a big antenna. Yeah, yeah. And when I would transmit at night, the, the dashboard would light up. You That's know? cool. And the guys doing the installation said, don't hold your hand on that antenna. When you transmit, you really get whacked. Wow. <laughs> but I was so surprised that it worked so well. Yeah. And I could talk, it was, we had a date at six o'clock every night. You'd get the Marine radio and they were stationed down off Atlantic City. World, long lines, long lines. And any ship, any place could get to long lines and then they'd hook you to a telephone. Wow. And then I you could that. talk, but they'd change frequencies until they got you clear, you know? The original book did a great job talking about the hurricane, but I would like to know, honestly, I mean, how scared were you? Were you ever, did you ever think, you know, this boat's in danger of, well, of breaking up on According us? to Al, I told him that one night in the hurricane that uh, we were gonna say goodbye to each other because I really didn't think I was gonna live through the night. And I said, you know, I've been very lucky. I've been blessed everything I had and all and he said what about me I'm, I'm still young I guess he wasn't married Dante wasn't married either I'm not ready to die I said, <laughs> anyway uh, it seemed like you know it's pitch black we very seldom even ran with running lights unless we saw another ship and with the radar reflector on the masthead they still never saw you they never saw you. You'd be talking to them like, we're five miles off your port bow. Do you see us on radar? No. Well, that radar is going way over our heads, you know. It's So they, none of the ships really see you uh, as far as running lights and stuff like that. So the boat is black, the dash lights maybe. But uh, the waves, always weird in the bad weather you'd expect the following sea and we let her run following sea and my boat doesn't broach it just surfs you know so that was the way we would run but every once in a while a wave would hit you broadside I say where the hell are these coming from you can't see anything except you can see the white water defined from the blue water as it breaks and it's like a cloud you know you could say boy that's a white cloud coming no it's the surf on top of one of these and when they hit you sideways it's just shock terrific shock and boat would go up on our hands and i don't know if i really thought we were gonna get drowned that night but uh, i was probably questioning the survival you know and he got very indignant I'm not ready to die. I said, well, neither am I, but we are going to do our best. <laughs> you, you, you say into the good Lord, I'm going to do five million things when I get home. I'll never do that again. I'll never drink again. I'll never fight with my wife. <laughs> and of course, you kept all of those. Oh, and, and, and more. Yes, you're up to 6,000. <laughs> yeah. So as far as really thinking we were done, I think one of the one of the uh, hardest things to do was to pull out that first day to pull out of the harbor mm. and see the land disappearing and not knowing you know if you miss the azores it's going to be almost 3000 miles i think the azores was 1700 miles so we didn't we weren't that confident The storm would eventually subside, and the Grovers would step foot on dry land on Flores Island, a 55 square mile spit of land on the western side of the Azores. Al hit the dock and took off, remembers Grover, of his then 29-year-old son. 
I didn't see him for two weeks, and he didn't really have any money to speak of. I called my wife and said, I'm shot. I'm coming home. She said, you can't. She knew I'd be miserable. She said, you stay there. I'm sending Dante. Now, Dante was 25 years old at the time and had already been running his father's business for seven years. He had previously been quoted on the local news as saying, quote, there is no way I'll ever go on that trip. So it came to be that Dante begrudgingly found himself aboard Transatlantic for a decidedly more mundane final 800 miles to Portugal's mainland. When Grover laid eyes on the European continent, he shook his son awake and said, there's Europe, do you believe it? I thought I'd never see it. In a tone children reserve, especially for their parents, he replied, it looks like Block Island to me. News of Grover's triumphant crossing made waves throughout the boating world. Newspaper clippings in several different languages now rest in a worn old photo album. The following year, Grover returned to Europe where he left the boat and continued cruising with his wife and two daughters. His journey culminated in a nondescript Norwegian field and the childhood home of Ole Evenrude, the man whose legacy powered Grover for those many miles. I visited Grover a second time after he found a pair of photo albums from his incredible journey. And after a few more hours of talking boats, we were walking inside from the dock in his backyard. You know, looking through those old photo albums and talking about this story has brought up some great memories for me, he said. He stopped as we neared his house. He looked at me and said, you know, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. You have to find what you love to do and do that or you'll be miserable. I found what I love. Since the story ran an outboard and power motor yacht, Grover and I have traded phone calls. He likes to laugh at my headline for the story. This is Al Grover, the legend, he says when I pick up his call. Legend is a term that carries a lot of weight, though one definition I've found is, a legend is someone who leaves behind an unforgettable impression on others. They touch lives, they're remembered, they're cherished. There are all sorts of legends in this world, famous or not. Becoming one means finding your particular role, your calling and following it, and touching others around you. When I think of Grover and his incredible adventure, and all those he's inspired to cruise beyond their comfort zone, I think the title's perfect. <laughs>